we just go ahead and get started. How's that? I was waiting for noise, weren't y'all? I was like, quiet, and my crickets. Need that cricket sound effect we don't have. I'm still cold from the water. Um, we've been looking at following Jesus. How about that here at church? Um, but no, real specifically, just, just what it looks like to follow him, what it, what it means to follow him. Um, and so that's not going to change today. We're just, we're just going to keep, keep throwing through that. Uh, and just a couple things we've learned. I'm not going to be big review. If you want to kind of see where we've been, you can go on the website, look at uh, sermons, live worship, and they're all recorded there, uh, unless there was some kind of weird technical thing, and then they fall off. But hopefully they're all there. Uh, but we did learn just one real cool thing is that every person who's ever followed Jesus was an unbeliever and a sinner. And many of them in the first century, all of his, actually all of his disciples, were unbelievers for about two years. They followed Jesus, followed Jesus for up to two years before they ever actually believed in him, before they ever actually understood who he was, before they kind of gave over themselves to him. They just kind of followed him and kind of leaned in and listened. And for some reason, Christianity today tells people that you can't do that anymore. If you're going to follow Jesus, that means you've got to walk down an aisle, you've got to shake somebody's hand, you've got to say, I give up, I'm, I'm, now I can follow Jesus. But listen, unbelievers and sinners are the people who should be following Jesus. You remember that whole tax collector scene when Jesus looked out the window and said, listen, you're not sick, you don't need to follow. I need to be here with these guys. So he, the call, the invitation is to everyone to follow him. And you all, if you're a follower now, if you're a faithful, which we would call a faithful follower, one that who now believes Jesus is their Lord, was the same way. You follow Christ. Many of us looked at, or some of us grew up this way, but many of us followed Christ by just kind of listening and seeing what people were doing. And then we got messed up. We started following Christians. And that never, ever works out. Uh, but everybody had the invitation to follow. Still has the invitation to follow, regardless now of your spiritual condition. Then last week you said, where are we going? We decided that where we're going in this thing is an overwhelming faith that, or a, a faith in God that overwhelms fear. That's where Jesus wants to take you. Because you and I fear all the time. And what Jesus wants to get us to is a place in our life where we have so much faith in God that it, that it overwhelms all fear and that we can actually follow the commandment, fear not. That's where he wants to get us. Not to heaven, which is going to be good. Not to be a better person, which you are. But to have a faith that beats fear. That's where he wants us to go. That's what we talked about last week. Today, which I know you're all interested to find out. What do Christians wear? What do they wear? What, what, what are you as a Christian supposed to be wearing? You know, a, a lot of people say, what's a Christian look like? Well, today I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you what I'm doing. Here's a couple of examples. Because we do this in our whole life. Who we follow, we usually, we usually wear something that identifies us as a follower of something. Let me show you these fans right here. It, it happens all the time. Who are these guys? Who's he following? Yeah, absolutely. Green Bay Packers, we know. Who are they following? I did that for points at home. Who's she following? Oh, yeah, some of y'all can read. Anybody know that? That's the Brazil soccer team. Yeah, yeah. And as sports fans, man, we love to dress up like the person we're following. We like to wear uh, something that identifies us as a follower. How about this? Oh, listen to you. You got all church people on me. Look at ooh, don't say that. Yeah, Muslim. They're they're following. She they are following Muhammad. Uh, we, we dress like we were. How about these guys? Not Moonies. Uh, close. What? Now Buddhists. They're they're Buddhist priests. They're following Buddha. Buddha. How about this guy? Who's he following? Huh? Who's he following? No. Oh, this guy is actually, listen, this, this, is how, this is how unintuned we are with the rest of the world. 
this, because we all live in America and, you know, we're the greatest planet, on, you know, we're the greatest nation on the planet and everybody should follow us and we should bomb you if you're stupid or whatever. This guy, he is following the fifth largest religion in the world it's called Sikhism. He's a Sikh. He's a Sikh. And they always have that hairdress on, that, that one. That doesn't, nobody else, no, nobody following Allah, nobody following Muhammad. They don't, that's a Sikh, okay? So you didn't even know that. Maybe you didn't even know that, I don't know. How about this guy? <laughs> wow, isn't that cool? Because you and I do it too. You know, what should Jesus followers wear? Should we wear that? We ought to, we ought to wear that. Oh, if you want to, if you want to. Well, so that's, that's extreme number one. This is extreme number two. Uh, they're all following the same God, according to them. Which one are you? I mean, that, this is the far extreme, the, the other side, but that's what those Christians wear to show them who God is or to show others who God is. So you got two spectrum ends there of what you could wear. But did you know the Bible actually tells you what to wear to follow Jesus? To identify yourself as a follower of Jesus. And, and you should be kind of nervous because uh, Paul tells us about this, and it was before zippers or buttons. Um, so let's just look at what it says. Paul, if you know anything about him, he, he was, used to be called Saul of Tarsus. Uh, he was a Christian hater. Uh, he was actually called, in Acts chapter 26, he calls himself a Christian hunter, which many of us who hunt can identify with, but he was a hunting Christian. That was his lifelong passion as Saul of Tarsus was to hunt down as many Christians as possible, and when he found them, he had the law behind him to just kill them. He could just kill them at any time. He, he had it in his mind that he was going to put down this, this cultish knockoff Judaism. Uh, somebody who, some, some people who had gone the wrong way, who weren't following Judaism anymore, he became this hunter. But then, in the process of this, we learn in Acts that he became one. He followed Jesus followers around so much that he became a Jesus follower. He became one. And then he started planting churches. And then he began to coach them, and he would write letters to them, and, and we have all that in our Bible, that's the New Testament, three quarters of it, are, are these letters that Paul wrote to these churches that he started so that they could kind of build their faith a little bit, and they could understand where they were supposed to be doing it, and, and why they were there, and, and all this stuff. Uh, so, so he, and he, but he didn't follow Jesus directly. He, he got his teachings from those who followed Jesus. So he learned how to follow Jesus from those who had followed Jesus, which is exactly where you and I are. We, we learn these things. So that's where he took his teachings from. He took them that he learned, and then he expounded on them to the Gentiles. Because as we told you, Matthew wrote to Jews. He, he gave us kind of like synopsis. Luke wrote to Gentiles. He gave us the detail. Well, this is Paul. He, he went out, and he started speaking to people like you and me, but we didn't understand. They didn't understand this Jewish religion, this, this thing that they were kind of, they made, actually a Jew could make a good cross real quick if they were just open to it. But Gentiles had a harder time. They had all kinds of stuff they were following. So Paul would break it down for them. And, and he does that for us in what to wear. And the primary teaching of Jesus that Paul leveraged over and over and over was right at the end of the Jesus story. Right before Jesus was going to get arrested. Judas is out of the picture. And Jesus gathers his closest followers to him. And he says, I want you all to get really, really close because I'm about to leave and, and where I'm going you, you can't follow. And, you know, I can imagine their minds started going, wait a minute. We've been following you for three years. We're, now why are, you, why are you going somewhere we can't go? What do you want us to do? You made us quit our jobs. You had all this, that going on. And now we can't follow you? What are you talking about? No, no. He, he, he wants to bring them in. He wants to teach them the main thing as far as practical living goes. And we did a whole sermon series on this part. But we're just going to do a really quick review. John chapter 13, verse 34. If you've got you version, it's right there on live. I think, let me check you version, make sure it's working. It's working? Good. So John chapter 13, verse 34, says, a new command I give you, and yes, you've heard this before, but Jesus would probably, and you and I, we don't get it, we, we hear it, uh, he would say, you need to take your cue from me, love one another, how, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. And can you imagine those guys sitting there under Jesus, Jesus would have looked at Matthew and said, Matthew, remember? We saw this two weeks ago. Matthew, remember? I came up to you in the tax collector's booth. 
Peter wanted to spit down your throat, and I loved you anyway. I told you to follow me. Nobody else liked you, Matthew. Nobody. Except for other tax collectors, which nobody else liked. But I love you. That's how I want you to go and love people. He probably looked at Nathaniel and said, Nathaniel, remember? Remember what you said about me? The first thing out of your mouth when I said, follow me, you said, nothing good can come from Nazareth. You dissed my whole family, my whole town, and yet I still love you. That's what I want you to go out there and do. And he looked at the rest of the group probably and said, listen, you remember whenever I told you that story about eating my flesh and drinking my blood and, and you all kind of just abandoned me and were talking about checking out and wasn't going to do that anymore? I still loved you. I still brought you in. I still tried to keep you near me even though you were ready to run. That's what I'm talking about. Go love people the way I love you. That's what I'm talking about. Then he went on, verse 35. By this, th by what? By the simple fact that you love people the way I loved you, everyone will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. He's saying, I want to mark you. I want to I want to shape, I want to make you known as one of my followers. I want to I want to mark this in your life. I want everybody to look at it and say, look, this is uber important. I want you to I want you to get this. But Simon Peter would say this. Where are you going? Where are you going? Isn't that like you? I know, I know, you said love one another. But where are you going? I mean, Jesus would be like, what? Really? I just told you the main thing. I, I just told you what I wanted everybody to see when they looked at you, and you want to know where I'm going. I mean, is, is Simon Peter stupid or what? Is, is he just slow? Is he? Or is he like you? I know, I know, I know, I know. Love one another. But listen, my wife, she has this habit that I just can't get over. Love one another the way I love you. But, 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 gee, I know, I know, I know. You said love one another, but I cannot get along with these people at work. They're driving me insane. I've tried and I've tried and tried. Can I come work at the church? Love one another. Love one another. See, it's not a religious thing. It's not a throwaway teaching. It wasn't something they were supposed to keep notes on and then go, like Peter did, but, but where are you going? See, you're not supposed to hear, love one another, and then say, but Jesus, what, what about? Love one another. Love one another. It's not, you know, in all religions, there's a gravitational pull away from treating people well and towards some type of routine. All those other religions I showed you, it's about a, a routine, a, a, a process, a tradition, which are all good. Routines, traditions, awesome, like them. But they can't be the main thing. And in all religions, we are pulled towards that. We would rather do that because when we do that, we're in control when it comes to rule keeping. We get to sit out there and say, I did this, I didn't do this, I did do this, but I said I'm sorry and God now forgives me and you didn't do none of that. You didn't say you were sorry. And since I've got my list going good, I don't have to really worry about you. I'll just focus on my list. Keeps you in control. And Jesus would say, that's not what this is about at all. At all. You know, I told, uh, I told our Sunday school, and I, I'll share this with you. I think I told Sherry and I had, like, solved the entire world problem. I felt really good about myself. Parents have screwed up Christianity. It's our fault. And it's your parents' fault. And it's your grandparents' fault. Because here's how we have taught our kids that this thing works. I'll look at my son, sometimes with disgust, but I'll say things like, really? I can't even get you to take out the trash after I've worked all week long to provide for you? Your mother has cooked this wonderful meal, and now you can't even do this one thing for me. 
You just wait till the next time you ask me for something. And I'm going to remind you of this day right here. And that's how we teach our kids relationships go. The more you give, the more you get. The more you get, the more you better give, or you won't get no more. Right? And whose model is that? Whose model? Mine. And it's yours. But it's not his. So we have come along, and Jesus has said, you know what? Well, okay, and I ask this question. What if Jesus lived your relationship with you like you lived your relationship with your kids? How would that work out every single morning? Hey, Jesus, listen, I'm getting ready to go to this job interview. Oh, really? And he would go, hold up, sister. You remember yesterday when I said you really needed to share my love with that person at the grocery store that cut you off in line? Remember I told you you should do that, and you went, yeah, and you flipped her off. Remember that? Remember that? Don't think I'll be helping you today in the interview process. I hope you learned your lesson. Then why do you and I do it? I mean, can you imagine if God didn't give us everything we needed for life and happiness unless we reciprocated? Not what he said. He says, go out and love one another the same way I love you. Your kids aren't exempt. Your spouse isn't exempt. Oh, don't even get me started on marriage and family relations. If you don't think there's some give and take in marriage as far as you do for me, I do for you, you're crazy and never been married or you're divorced. Because that's how we've been taught that relationships go especially our close family ones. We screwed it up. We screwed it up. We were like, but, but, God, listen, I do a lot, but they don't do anything. They need to learn. Hey, here's what we also tell them. You need to learn the Ten Commandments. Do you know what the Ten Commandments says? Do you know what number five says? Little Johnny? It says you have to obey me. Hmm? There you go. Teach them a rule really quick. Teach them a rule. Because that's what we're good at. The rule. The rule. I know there's going to be all kinds of emails this week. That's okay. We can go at it. But this gets so bad that there, are many, there may be some of you in the room today who, who've been treated badly in the name of Jesus. You, you've, actually, you've actually experienced this type of thing probably in the church. Probably. Dennis was just explaining, you know, in Dennis' manner, how there are people around here who do things with, for no thanks at all, for, for no, you know, they just, they just kind of do, and that is awesome, but that's not required. Many of you may have been ever in a church that said, well, you know what? You've got 20 minutes left on Monday. Why don't you help out? Why don't you do something? Why don't you do something around here? You know, we provided breakfast this morning. Why don't you clean up the room? Because if you don't, there may not be no breakfast. That's how our relationships go. And he says, love one another. Love one another. See, I, I may be wrong, and this is not in the Bible, but I don't think Jesus is very fond of us mistreating those he died for. And who did he die for? According to John 3, 16, everybody, everyone, that's right. So if you can find the guy that Jesus didn't die for, don't love him. That person, you don't have to love after you identify him. But you let me know because I don't want to love him either. But see, if Jesus hadn't have said this, then our Christianity would have become just like every other religion. We could have set up a little set of rules and we could have forgotten everybody else. And if they didn't fit into our perfect little picture, we wouldn't have to worry about it. He didn't do that. He did say it, and he said, this is the one thing that will mark you different than the rest. The one thing that will be how you treat other people will be a reflection of our relationship together. How you treat somebody tells the world what you think of Jesus. How you treat everyone is the indicator of what you think about Jesus. 
Well, what about that ex-husband of mine? He was an idiot. What about him? How you treat him is an example of how you think about Jesus. Love everyone. And now you're all thinking, well, he's one of them love sermons. He was really good. I didn't tell you he told you to put on love. I'm going to tell you what you're supposed to wear. Still going to get there. And he says, don't love them the way they should be treated. Don't love them the way they ought to be loved. Don't love them the way they loved you. Love them the way I love you. Don't even love them the way I love them. Love them the way I love you because that's the only thing you know. Don't ever try to replace what you do here on Sunday mornings or what you do on Wednesday night when you come to Bible study. Don't ever let that replace or substitute any routine or any ritual. Don't any, let any of that substitute the way you treat other people. Because it's the one thing that marks you as a Jesus follower. And it's very easy to confuse discipline with discipleship. And, and disciple simply means follow. Discipleship means teach to follow. And it's very easy to get those confused. Because we would rather discipline others. We'd rather get people to look better, act better, follow Jesus like you follow Jesus. Because you're following Jesus in a particular manner. It's very easy to get those confused. He told you to go make disciples, not disciplined. Love others. It's much easier to check things off a list than it is to love people who are hard to love. You all know people who are hard to love. Guess what? Jesus knew you. You were hard to love. But he did it anyway. He did it anyway. So 20 years goes by. It's not really a long time. You know, you've been taught maybe it's even longer than that, but here comes Paul. Just 20 years. Just not even a full generation of people has gone by, but here comes Paul. He's now a Christian. He goes all over the Mediterranean. He goes into synagogues, and he starts telling people about Jesus and what happened in Jerusalem, and they pick him up by his coattails and his belt loop, and they throw him out the front door, and he goes off into a little dark place, and eight or nine people follow him over and go, you know what, I kind of don't want to hear what you were talking about. And so Paul started a little church out of that. And then he'll go away and he'll write him a letter back. And, and, and they'll kind of get going on. And he does this over and over and over. And then he starts, and as he, the reason he's writing those letters is because he starts to get word that after he left, he gave them this message of just love one another that, that he learned from the other disciples. And he finds out that they're starting to act like morons. That they're starting to put, they're starting to put things on people. They're starting to put requirements on people. They're starting to say, well, you, you could join us if you mm, did this. You know, I, mm, it's not enough. It's not enough to say that you're going to follow Jesus. It's not enough. You need to do this. You need to wear a, a, a black belt rope around your toga when you come to church. You need to look a little better. You need to look for that. I don't know what they said. But Paul starts writing to him, no, 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 you mi- yo, back up, you're missing it. They were beginning to use their new religion as an excuse to mistreat people. They had found a way to segregate themselves off and mistreat the people who weren't in the circle. And so many of his letters just goes back to basics, love one another, love one another. But in some cases, he breaks it down into specifics, and that's what we're going to look at, Colossians chapter 3. This is really cool, I think. He says, this is what you're supposed to wear. You Christians out there, wear this stuff. And it's not t-shirts, not Christian t-shirts. I'm pretty sure it's not that. Here we go. It says, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, w- do what? Clothe yourselves with. Okay, so he's going to tell you what to put, seriously, he's going to tell you what to put on. So this is not a once and for all, because how often do you get dressed? Every day. So that's the concept of what Paul's going to tell you. You're going to clothe yourself. They're going to, sometimes those clothes are going to come off. You're going to have to put them back on. Therefore, clothe yourself with, and the first thing he tells us is compassion. Compassion. Clothe yourself with compassion. Put compassion on. It's not there. And, and compassion is two words that Paul would have used. You remember, have you ever said, I love you with all my heart? That was not in their text, okay? That's kind of the concept. They used the term, I love you with all my bowels. All my bowels. B-b-bowels. Your gu- I love you with my guts. 
Try that tonight after the kids go to bed. I love you with all my bowels. I think we changed it because it just didn't fit good. But that, that's, you, you felt this before. Whenever you have deep concern or compassion for someone, you don't go, oh. You go, mmm. That hurts. That hurts down deep. I, I feel, I feel for you, but I feel it from way down deep. That's what he's talking about. Clothe yourself with this down deep compassion. This is different than you should have worked harder. That may be true. It's different than you should have studied harder. That may be true. But the initial reaction is, I feel what you're feeling. My wife will tell you, this is my Achilles heel. I have trouble. I seriously do. My general flesh nature says, get over it. Isn't that you sometimes? Oh, cry me a river. You ever said that to somebody? How many have played the tiniest fiddle? Uh-huh. Yeah, we are, that's just general. That, that's our natural. That's, that's what's natural for you. That's what you've already got on. That's your clothes. And Paul says you need to take those clothes off and you need to put these clothes on. Compassion. The down deep. When somebody tells you anything that they're feeling, that you feel it. That you genuinely feel the same thing they're feeling, your initial response, and then you can go into the teachings later, but your initial response is that they know that you care. That's compassion. Regardless of whether they should have been able to do or not to do about the situation, or whether they even listened to you in the first place. How many of you ever told them that? You ever told somebody that? Well, if you listen to me, it wouldn't be in this shape. That's not compassion. That, I'm smarter than you are. Paul says, I want you to put this on. I want you to wear you to wear this. Kindness. That's the second one. Kindness. Kindness is when you loan your strength to someone else. When someone who doesn't have the strength to do something, you loan them your something needs, or someone needs something, and you extend yourself to them. You become them for just a minute, and you do it for them. You loan them their strength because they don't have enough of their own. This is not a habit you possess automatically. Your natural one is, I'm busy. I work. I'm, I, I, I'm already doing my own thing. Can't help you. Kindness is you extend yourself. You recognize that somebody's having trouble getting something done, whether it's physical, emotional, spiritual, whatever, and you lend them your strength. And you take that burden for them. That's, that's kindness. Paul says, put that on. You don't have it on. You're not born this way. You're not naturally kind. No one is. If we were, Paul would say, and leave your kindness on. He says, put it on. Wear this. Next one he tells us is humility. Humility. Now, now we kind of understand what humility is, right? It, it's, it's, bringing your, it's putting yourself back and, and bringing others forward. But look at what he's talking about here. Because in relation to other people, this is actually a little more simple. It's seeing myself as I really am in relation to other people and to God. Seeing yourself and not lowering yourself. That, you know, get humble. Humility is seeing yourself automatically as you really are. And then to do that, you have to understand how you really are. Because in relation to other people, I'm nothing more than a citizen of humanity. That's all I am. I'm not more successful. I'm not, I'm not, I don't have more money. Yeah, you don't, there's nothing about you that has elevated you above. But in relation to other people, you're exactly the same. You're just a human. Just a human who God loves. And when you look at people like that, when you don't look at them with an air of superiority, when you don't look at them as always needing something from you, but you are humilitied. Is that a good word? It'll work. Hey, he said it'll work. Back off. It's not about if you've paid your dues. It's not about your successes. It's not about, it's that you are loved by God, your creator, just like everyone else. Very basic humility. All the way back 
Paul says, put that on. Because you're very naturally prideful. You're very naturally better than someone else. And Paul says, put this on. You're no different. You're just not that special. But everyone else is just as special. Everyone is just as special in the eyes of God. That's humility. In the, then, then he goes on, he says, and then put on gentleness. The gentleness. What is gentleness? Let me tell you. It's the decision to respond to someone in light of your strengths and weaknesses instead of responding to them out of your strengths. Picture it this way. If there's a bowling ball sitting here, you pick it up with strength. If there's a contact lens laying here, you pick it up with the end of your finger. You have the capacity to do both. But the amount of strength you use is based on the object. So when you meet someone who doesn't have enough strength, when you meet someone who, who, who's having trouble, you respond to them with their level. You respond to them in a manner that brings you, that you gear it down a little bit if you have to. You're able to respond not because you're strong, not because you need to help somebody up, but because you're able to see and respond to them based on their strength. You're able to use your strength in, in level. A lot of times we come off as, my strength is more important than my relationship with you. And that's backwards. Jesus says, as you respond like this, your relationship becomes more important than people knowing how strong you are. That's gentle. That's gentle. He throws us another one. Patience. Patience. You've prayed it. God grant me patience, but please hurry. Right? No, patience. When you're in relation to other people, because that's what Paul's talking about. In relation to other people, patience is deciding to go the speed of another person. Deciding to go. Do you understand? Dennis, I'm going to throw you under a bus. Do you understand how hard it is for me to stand in a baptismal tub and listen to Dennis talk for 20 minutes? It is the longest baptism I've ever done. Right? But. What? Yeah, I don't know. Now I'm going to have to be thankful. No, but that, that is, that is, and I'm not saying I'm patient. Because that's hard. I've got to put that on. But patience is deciding to go the speed of the person who is the object. It's being able to relate. It means running out the door with everything you've got to do for the day and someone walking up and needing a minute. Patience. It's, it's, it's someone who can't get a spiritual uh, principle and constantly ask you the same exact thing over and over. Patience. We, go, we decide to go the speed of those who we're discipling. That's what that means. Not, not, not yours. Not my time is more important than your time. So Paul says, this is what you should be known by. What you should be wearing. And then he gives us a couple more to tie it back in. He goes on to verse 13. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive. Forgive. You're going to wear forgiveness. Okay, that, that's going to mark you as well. As the Lord forgave you. There it is again. Just like... Don't forgive them like they deserve to be forgiven. Don't forgive them as long as they've forgiven you. Forgive them just like God forgave you. Just like he forgave. And there's a whole study on how God forgives. But this is really simple. He just does. I don't need to know if God ever going to remember. I don't need to know if God's ever going to. I just know God forgives. So whenever you need to ask the question, should I forgive? The answer is always, always, always Yes. How can I forgive? Just like God forgave you. You didn't deserve it. You didn't do anything to gain it. He just did it. But it's hard. 
Well, if it was easy, the pagans would do it. This is what marks you different. This is different. It's supposed to be different. If it wasn't different, you'd look like everybody else. You can just go about your day and everybody going, no, I know he don't like her. You should have known. You know what they did to you. You know what she did to him. Ain't no way he likes her. Ain't no way he communicates. Ain't no way they do this. That's just natural. This is unnatural. Just like God forgave, you forgave. I like it. Then he gives one more. And over all these virtues, put on, put it on. Put it on. Why do I got to put on love? Because it's not natural. You're not wearing love, okay? God is love. You're not love. Which binds them all together in perfect unity. That's your driving force. So you got to picture this. Love is the umbrella, okay, that goes over this whole thing. You've put it on top of all these other qualities that he told you to put on. This would be your raincoat. Maybe umbrella's the worst. Raincoat's better than umbrella. Put this love over the whole thing so that when somebody says, how can you be compassionate to them? Because I love them. How can you be patient with them? Because I love them. Why are you kind to them? Don't you know what kind of person? Because I love them. You see, you've got an answer for the whole, it's love thing. Well, it's a love thing because he loves me. And it looks very different when I start putting these details in it. So here's our follow wear. <laughs> this is what we wear to follow. Compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, forgiveness, love. Those are the things you should be putting on every day. And I think, since for some of us who are Christians who like lists to check off, you should check these off. You should get in your car. If you're going, get on your bike. Right before you get out of bed, put these on. You know, you got the whole armor of God that goes on. I mean, listen, as a Christian, you start to look kind of dressed for this thing. Can you remember all those? Can you? Okay, Andy Stanley came up with a mnemonic because I really like this list and he really likes this list and... It helps me. Um, has anybody ever seen a chick flick? You've seen a chick flick? Have you ever seen a chick flick that's uh, rated PG? Do they even exist? They do? No, they don't? Okay. Well, this is, this is how we're going to remember this, okay? Chick flick, PG. This is lame. I should have told you that ahead of time. I understand. And yes, kindness is in there twice because it only works that way. We're gonna run a. We're gonna run a. Uh, we're gonna run a, um, a. A contest. If you can come up with a better analogy or a, a better, what's it called? Not acrostic, but mnemonic. Just mnemonic. How we can remember this. But this is how you do it. Chick flick. I'm gonna be when I get in my car before I. Die, I'm gonna be compassionate to people today. God, I know I'm getting ready to interact with someone who's really gonna need no compassion. And, and, and I'm gonna put humility on. I'm gonna. I'm going to see myself and I'm going to see others exactly the same in your eyes. I'm going to look at every single person as exactly the same. I am not better than anybody else in your eyes. We're all the same. I'm going to be kind to people. I'm going to have kindness on my heart. I'm going to lend my strength to others. I'm going to do this as you would have done it for me. I'm going to be kind to others. I'm going to forgive others. When I know they don't... E when my mind says there's no way you should forgive them, you better always remember, I'm going to forgive, but I'm not going to forget, you know, whatever. I'm going to put forgiveness on me. I'm going to have it with me because I know I'm going to need it, and I'm going to use it as there. Flick, right? Chick flick, PG. Love. I'm going to love others just like you loved me. I don't know how I would love them, but I'm going to love them like you loved me. I'm just going to love people. And I'm, I'm not going to answer questions of why and how. And how. I'm just going to love people. And, and kindness, because I'm going to have to be kind a couple of times. And I'm going to be very patient. I, I'm going to have to put on this face. God, I know that I'm getting ready to deal, and I don't want to. My type A personality wants to go, 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 go. I'm going to be patient. I'm going to decide to go the speed of those around me who you've put in my path. That's just what I'm going to do. I'm going to put myself backwards a little bit. I've already 
said I'd wear humility, so now I'm going to use that humility and be patient with others. And I'm going to be gentle. God, I'm going to respond to people with the strength necessary based on the object. I'm going to be gentle when others need me to be gentle. Not me. You see how all this, all this is a picture of how others look at you, not how you see yourself. This is all in relation to this. So when you want to understand how you want to love people, well, you're going to do it by wearing these things. But can I be honest? When I read that kind of stuff, it sounds really good in here. But I want to ask, how am I going to get anything done? I mean, if I was at home, homeschooling Gracie, just her, or a bunch of other preschoolers, yeah, this looks like something I'd put in a Sunday school class down in Lulu's group, right? That looks like something we, we would teach our kids to be kind. we teach our kids to love each other. But this is for us. This should be in your Sunday school room. This should be in your house. Here's how I'm going to do it. I'm going to understand that it's possible. I'm going to understand that I'm following the pattern of a guy named Paul who did this. Who, a guy named Paul who did more in just a few years than you'll do in your whole life. Someone who I'm still talking about today over 2,000 years after he did this. And I'm going to remember that in 2,000 years, nobody's going to know me. I'm going to remember that in 2,000 years, nobody's going to know you. I don't care if you come up with the greatest computer program, nobody's going to be talking about you in 2,000 years. And yet here we are, talking about a guy who said, this is what you wear. This is what it should look like. And he did it. He got on ships that you wouldn't get on. He got snake bit. He got shipwrecked. He got beaten. He got stoned. And I mean, not recreationally. He got hurt. It can be done. It does happen. It should happen. As long as you put it on. And this is much easier. I've told you before, you can live a sinless life. Do you know that? You can live one. You can live a sinless life. It is possible. It's been done. Jesus did it. He was the example. And after you follow him, if he's now your light, you can live a sinless life. We don't do it. Hadn't met anybody that has, but it's possible. Did you know you can get pregnant without a man? It's possible. See, because God makes babies, we don't make babies. It's possible. Doesn't happen very often. Only happens once. But it's possible. And if all those things are possible, this is so much easier. Even though it looks like you can't do it. You can do it. It's not natural, but it's possible. It's not natural. Every day I have to put this on. See, but the problem is you'll, go, you'll, you'll hear this today and maybe you'll think it's cool. Maybe you'll think, yeah, maybe I, it's good. Right, we can try this. I can chick flick PG, stupid, but I can remember it. And today at lunch, maybe you'll talk about chick flick PG, and you'll you'll think, oh, I need to be kind. I mean, and tomorrow, it might even go into tomorrow a little bit. You'll even talk about it. Maybe with us, you go, remember, I'm supposed to be patient. I need to remember patient. But then along about Tuesday or Wednesday or so, you're going to be going like, oh, I wonder what we're going to do next week. And you'll put it aside. And Paul says, you're going to have to keep doing this. You're going to have to keep putting it on. You're going to have to remember to do it every single day because it is not natural. Many of you will spend more time in your clothes closet, your physical clothes, trying to figure out what to wear tomorrow so that you look good before you even hesitate. You won't even think about this. The Bible says, put this on. Put this on. This doesn't take hardly any time at all. And yet we will stand in front of our closet. There, uh, what's this back to that? Nah, that's old. And that's where we. That's where we go. That's where we stand. Put this on. Maybe we need to put those in our closet. I don't know. It's a good idea. 
So I've told you, you want to come up better, better an acronym, come up with one. That'd be, that'd be good. You, but you, and you may even have some good qualities. You're driven. You're successful. Cool. This goes with it. You put this on with it. God still wants you to be successful and driven and, and, and all those things. But he wants you to filter it through this lens. He wants you to be a successful, kind person first. Or he wants you to be a forgiving, kind, or a forgiving, successful person. A loving, successful person. That's the lens. Wouldn't it be great? Chick flick, PG. Or, we can do that. He's a freak. He's a freak. They're a freak. We're all kind of freaks. But many times we think that's what we're supposed to do. That's what we want to mark ourselves with so that people will know who we are. Paul says, nope, that's like that. That's like that. Maybe you've been out of this for a while. Maybe you're just coming back to church. Maybe you're, when you go up north, you, you know, can I just apologize ahead of time for those of us who thought this was right? And maybe ask you to keep on following Christ, even though you've met a bunch of half-dressed or non-dressed Christians. Can I ask you to just keep leaning in to Jesus, regardless of who you encounter that's not dressed right? Can I ask you to just, just lean into him and follow him? Don't abandon your quest. Because you encounter someone who forgot to get dressed in the morning. Follow. And I'll take you all the way. Stand with me and we'll get out of here. God is, um, we kind of end this ritual. May we have been motivated to come here because we're following you. May the thing we call church be secondary to our relationship with you. So that as others come around us, they see you, not our church. I pray, God, that we put this list on. That we will check ourselves in the mirror of your word to ensure that we look like you want us to look. Thank you for providing the things we need to wear, for the ability to be compassionate and humble and kind, forgiving, and loving, and patient, and gentle. Thank you for the energy to do that. I accept it from you, and I pray that we become a people who do the same thing. God, I pray that you take us out of here. Drop us right in the middle of our mission field, God. Mark us with your mark so that others see you in us. In your name we pray. Amen. Uh, tonight's what we call Sabbath night. We ask you to go and enjoy your family around the nature of honoring God today. Come back with us Wednesday night at 530 in the room in the back. We'll have supper together and Bible study. God bless you.